Power Query's group by feature is one of the most useful features in Power Query. It allows you to take a list like this of, say, sales by sales rep and aggregate the sales by each sales rep name so you can get a total sales by sales rep. It's very similar to a pivot table in Excel. When you invoke a group by function from the user interface, Power Query uses a table.group function. The table.group function has five arguments. The first three arguments most users are familiar with, like the table argument, which is the table you're feeding, the table.group function. The key argument, which is the column you're scanning to group things by. And then the aggregated columns, which are the calculations you're making, like summing up the sales or counting the sales. But the other two optional arguments most people have never seen. The first of those two is the group kind function. This changes the grouping strategy. And that's what this video is going to focus on. The fifth argument, which is also optional, is the comparer, which sets the case sensitivity of the table.group function. We'll look at that at the end. So let's focus on the group kind optional argument and see what this does. We'll start with a table like this of sales reps and their sales. When invoking the group by function from the user interface, the following bit of M code is written behind the scenes for us. So we'll take the previous steps output, which is a table, and by scanning the sales rep column, we'll group each similar transaction into a single line item and create a new column called total sales, which will run a sum function on the sales column of the original table. So this gives us the orange table at the bottom. Again, you've done this with pivot tables probably a thousand times. But if we wanted to add some of those optional arguments, this is what our M code would look like. To initiate the alternate grouping strategy, we take the original M code, add a comma, and then place the switch group kind local in that fourth argument position. This addition to the M code has to be done manually. You can't do this through the user interface. And while we're here, just to see what the syntax looks like if you're going to use the fifth optional argument, that would be something like the compare.ordinal ignore case switch, which would allow you to perform case insensitive grouping. Now, if you're going to use that case insensitive switch, but not use the group kind.local, you still have to provide something in the fourth optional argument, and that would be group kind.global. Group kind.global is the default grouping strategy, which is just to group every like item together. So if you're not changing that strategy, you still have to define it. But let's see an example where the group kind.local would be of better use. Suppose we want to get the number of consecutive days within a certain temperature range. And when that temperature range changes, we want to reset the counting. So we'll create these categories. Freezing would be anything that's less than or equal to 32 degrees. Cold would be anything that's between 32 and 50 degrees. Chilly would be between 50 degrees and 70 degrees. Warm between 70 and 85. And then hot would be anything over 80 degrees. Now these are all Fahrenheit. If you're using Celsius, you just have to do the math. But what we want to see is the number of days we remain within a single category. So we'll count the number of days we're in, say, the cold section. But until we switch to chilly or freezing, we just keep counting. But the moment we do switch to one of those adjoining temperature ranges, we want to reset the count. So we don't want to just group all of the cold days within, say, a five-year period together and count them. We want to count the number of times we remained in the cold range until we switched into another range. Let's see this in an example. This file and all the other files that I'm going to use in this video are available for download, link in the video description. And make sure you watch to the end of the video because I'm going to show you some really cool ways to do some alternate storytelling with the group by feature. Here's an Excel table with the average daily temperature recorded each day over a one year period. So you can see each day, you can see the average daily temperature. Now notice we have this range column where depending on where that temperature falls, it's either a cold day, a freezing day, a warm, a chilly, or a hot. So just looking right here in this little group, we can see we had a 15 day stretch where it was warm, but then we had a one day hot, and then we went back to warm again, where we had a nine day stretch. Before that, we had a three day chilly stretch. Let's bring this into Power Query and group it by the range and see what results we get. So we'll go to data, from table range. We'll select the range column, go up to group by. We wanna group by range, and we'll create a new calculated column called consecutive days and this will count the number of days within each group. We'll hit okay, and we can see we had 42 freezing days over the course of the year, 88 chilly, 133 warm, etc. The thing is, I don't want to know how many total warm days there were over the whole year. I wanna know how many warm days there were in an unbroken set of warm days. This was the M code that was created when we used group by through the user interface. 
Take the previous step, scan the range column, group by that, and then create a new column called consecutive days, performing a row count operation. What we're going to do is add that optional argument called group kind local. Now we can't do this to the UI, we have to do this in the M code. Now before we open up the advanced editor, notice the group rows step in the applied settings panel. It has that gear icon. If we click the gear, we can open this group by dialog box and we can make changes. The reason I'm pointing this out is the moment we go into the M code and add those optional arguments, we're going to lose that gear. So if you need to add any additional columns of calculations, you should probably do it now while you can do it through the UI. Now, if you need to do that later, after you've lost the gear, I'm gonna show you how to get the gear back. So let's go up to the advanced editor and we can see here the table.group function. So I'm going to click just before the close parentheses, add a comma, and you can see here in the help, it's asking for the group kind. So if it's been a while since you've used this and you can't remember what the switch is, the switch is the name of the argument. So if I start to type in GR, I can automatically see there's group kind global and group kind local. And I'm going to choose group kind local. We'll hit done. And now you can see we have a list of consecutive days while we were in the same temperature range. So we had six days in freezing, followed by four days of cold. If we scroll down, we can see we had two days of cold, followed by three days of chili, back to three days of cold, eight days of chili, then a day of warm, and then back to two days of chili. And the list goes on and on. Now what would probably be more helpful is to know when that temperature range started and ended, but we can't go to the gear over here in the applied steps to extract that first date and last date of the temperature range. So what we'll have to do is go back into the advanced editor, and temporarily take out this optional argument. We'll hit done, that gives us our gear back. Now that's not ideal, but that's just the way the interface works. So I'll go to the gear, we'll switch to advanced mode, and we'll add an aggregation called start day, and this will run a min function on the date column. We'll also add an aggregation called end day, and this will run a max function on the date column. We'll hit okay. Now right now these start days and end days don't really apply because of the way we're grouping the ranges. So we'll go back to the advanced editor. So we're taking the previous steps output, which is a table. We're scanning the range column, and then we're creating a list of lists. The first list is the consecutive days, which just counts the rows. The second list, and takes each group and pulls the lowest date from that group. And then the end date, which takes each list and pulls the last day of that group. If we now put our cursor just before the closed parentheses, we'll type in a comma and add back that group kind argument. So group kind dot local. Hit done. And now we know the consecutive day range, but say in this case, there were six consecutive days in the freezing temperature range that started on January 10th and ended on January 15th. Then we had a four day range in the cold starting on the 16th and going to the 19th. Scrolling down, we can see we had a 34 day range of warm starting on July 22nd, ending on August 24th. So where we started with the group kind local switch to perform this sequential counting instead of the overall counting, we went back and we added two more arguments for the start date and the end date. Now let's make this a little more interesting. Let's say we wanted to get the average temperature in that date range. So I know there was a 15 day period of warm, but what was the average temperature in that 15 day period? To make it easier, we'll go back to the advanced editor and temporarily remove this group kind dot local switch. This way we can get our gear back. We'll go to the gear. We already have consecutive days, which is counting the rows, a min to find the start date, a max to find the last date, but let's also add another aggregation called average temperature. And maybe we'll let them know it's in Fahrenheit. And this will just perform an average function on the average daily temperature column. And now we have our average daily temperature. We'll go back to the advanced editor, click just before the closed parentheses on the group step and re-add the group kind.local. Looking at the updated M code, here we can see where we've added the average temperature. We'll close and load this into Excel, and here's our list of consecutive days within a given temperature range, the day that temperature range started, ended, and the average temperature during that period. Now before we leave this video, I wanna pay some attention to that fifth optional argument that controls case sensitivity. We have this blue table where we've got the same sales reps names repeated but in some cases they're proper case, some cases they're all uppercase, and in some cases they're lowercase. If we were to use Power Query's group by tool in its default setting, this green table would be our output because it treats everything in a case sensitive manner. So the bills would not be grouped together, the freds would not be grouped together, the tammies would not be grouped together. But if we could employ a case insensitive switch, then we could get the output like this orange table. 
So we don't want to group like we did before with the temperatures where we're grouping every time we see a change. We want to do the normal global grouping. We just want it to be case insensitive. So let's look at the M code for this. So here we are in the Power Query editor. You can see we've connected to the source. We set our data types and we grouped. But because we couldn't do it in a case insensitive way, the grouping didn't perform the way we wished. Let's go to the advanced editor. So looking at the M code, we'll click just before the close parentheses of the table.group step. We'll add a comma. Now this is asking for the group kind. Now unlike Excel, you can't just place another comma there and accept the default behavior. You actually have to put something here. Now we don't want to change its behavior, so we'll use the group kind called group kind.global. This is the group by's default behavior. Comma, and now it's asking for the comparer. And the comparer we want is comparer, and I'll scroll down to compare.ordinalIgnoreCase. That's the switch for case insensitivity. Now this switch can be used in a lot of other places in Power Query, like when you're doing find operations or lookup operations. So always investigate the optional arguments for these functions. So we're still grouping by local, but we want to ignore case. I'll click done. Now we're getting the grouping that we thought we were going to get, but it's being done in a case insensitive way. If we close and load this back out, we'll get the output in this orange table. So this is how we can use some of the optional arguments for the group by feature and take a list of dates and temperatures like this and turn it into a report like this. Now I've included in the download file some extra things you might want to do in an example like this, such as you might want to perform some conditional formatting and that way you can get the blues and the red color scheme. But also I've enhanced the M code to show not only the daily temperature in Fahrenheit, but also how to convert that into Celsius. So if you wanted to show Celsius instead, or if you wanted to show both. I also have an example here that shows us how to aggregate the temperatures at a monthly level and then pick out the lowest temperature, the highest temperature in both Fahrenheit and Celsius. So all that M code is here. So let me know what you think about the group kind.local optional argument. Could you use it? And does this give you a better insight into the optional features that you might not have even known existed so you can go beyond what's in the user interface? Remember to download this file, link in the video description, and let me know in the comments how cool you think this is. Thank you so much for watching. Your time and attention has really helped this channel grow in ways that we never expected. And remember, at BCTI, the learning never stops.